It's Friday, July 1st. President Biden vows his administration will take action to ensure access to abortion medication, even in states that ban it. Abortion rights advocates say he could do that by declaring the cutoff of abortion services in about half the states constitutes a public health emergency. The Biden administration, we've been talking today again and again about how this is a public health emergency. And the Biden administration, through the Secretary of Health and Human Services, could declare a public health emergency. Friday afternoon on a holiday weekend, the Biden administration announces plans for up to 11 offshore oil and gas sales drawing immediate fire from climate groups. A Russian airstrike on residential areas kills at least 21 people near the Ukrainian Black Seaport of Odessa. WikiLeaks whistleblower Julian Assange appeals to Britain's high court to stop his planned extradition to the United States. Chinese leader Xi Jinping travels to Hong Kong to mark the 25th anniversary of the island's return to Chinese rule. And a special report on the unregulated use of police dogs, which are often deployed against people suspected only of minor crimes. Police might be stopping somebody for shoplifting or disorderly conduct. The use of a dog can elevate what is a passing moment, a small crime into a permanent life injury. From KPFA Berkeley and KPFK Los Angeles, this is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandari. President Biden today pledged the federal government will protect the right of women to receive abortion medication. Some states that have banned abortion are also acting to bar the shipment of abortion pills to patients. If states try to block a woman from getting medication, the FDA has already approved and has been available for more than 20 years. My administration will act and protect that woman's right to that medication. Biden did not specify how the federal government would protect patients seeking abortion medication. He also acknowledged there currently aren't enough votes in the Senate to change filibuster rules so as to allow a vote on federal legislation codifying Roe v. Wade and reinstating the right to abortion across the country. Although he did not mention them by name, Democrats Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are opposed to a waiver of the filibuster rule. But ultimately, Congress is going to have to act to codify the f- row into federal law. As, as I said yesterday, the filibuster should not stand in the way of us being able to do that. But right now, we don't have the votes in the Senate to change the filibuster on, on, at, the, at the moment. That means we need two more votes now, uh, not now, when we vote, probably after November, uh, more senators and House majority Biden held a virtual meeting with governors of pro-choice states, many of which already are experiencing increased demand for abortion services from neighboring states that have outlawed or severely restricted the procedure. New York Democratic Governor Kathy Hochul said her state is working to enshrine the right to abortion in the state constitution, as California voters are likely to do in November. North Carolina Democratic Governor Roy Cooper said his state's Republican control legislature wouldn't allow such a move, but he said he will block any attempt to approve anti-abortion legislation. Because of our location in the southeast, Mr. President, North Carolina is already seeing an influx of patients coming to our state for safe care. According to Planned Parenthood of the South Atlantic, their clinics in North Carolina have scheduled 192 patients from out of state for the next week alone. That means about 10,000 extra patients from out of state coming to North Carolina in the next year, mostly from states that have bans and tighter restrictions. And those, Mr. President, are just the numbers from Planned Parenthood. That doesn't include our state's other trusted providers. So we know those numbers will be a lot higher. 
Reproductive rights groups are urging Biden to declare a public health emergency to empower the federal government to protect pharmacists who prescribe abortion medication and allow patients to consult with medical providers via telemedicine. Some states are moving to forbid the shipment of the medication and to ban telemedicine. Nancy Northup is the CEO of the Center for Reproductive Rights and among the abortion rights leaders calling for declaration of a public health emergency which would supersede state bans on abortion medication. Because these bans are frustrating the administration of a drug that mitigates this public health emergency. So that is one of the things that could have an enormous impact because the reality is people in states that ban abortion are going to be seeking to get medication abortion and it would be really important for them to be able to get it through telemedicine from other states. Northup added that the week-old Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade is causing mayhem. The ACLU's Anthony Romero agrees and predicts years of litigation unless Congress passes federal legislation. You know, the Supreme Court and Justice Alito and the anti-abortion advocates thought this was going to settle the question. They are going to see how, just how wrong they are. Um, the proliferation of litigation that will embroil the states and our country for years to come uh, is going to underscore the fact that this is not settled. Northup said the most recent of numerous lawsuits is in Oklahoma. In last week alone, our three organizations have collectively gone to court in 11 states to restore or preserve abortion access. Those states include with a lawsuit in Oklahoma just filed this morning, Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana, Arizona, Utah, Kentucky, Idaho, West Virginia, Florida, Ohio, and as of this morning, Oklahoma. And you can expect more cases to be coming in the coming days. Meantime, Northup said some state legislatures are heading into special session to take up anti-abortion laws, including some that may label abortion homicide and others that will likely try to prevent people from crossing state lines to obtain the procedure. Other anti-abortion state officials already are eyeing laws to ban certain types of contraceptives, such as IUDs. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, in effect, invited a challenge to the 1965 Griswold case, which found a constitutional right by married couples to buy and use contraceptives. Planned Parenthood President and CEO Alexis McGill-Johnson said new laws could seek to ban in vitro fertilization, IVF, as well as certain contraceptives. The introduction of incredibly extreme laws across the country that are, you know, not only related to access to abortion, but criminalizing IVF, criminalizing IUDs, criminalizing emergency plan B and contraception, Um, you know, states considering, um, you know, what contraception to carry in state will also be, um, you know, a question of contraception. I think that there was a set of GOP state AGs who were openly questioning whether or not Griswold uh, was correctly decided. So we know that contraception is clearly on the table. Abortions are still being provided in Florida after a judge blocked a new state law from taking effect today that would ban the procedure after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Florida's current law bans abortion after 24 weeks, consider the point of viability outside the womb. Florida's constitution contains an explicit right to privacy. The judge said in his ruling that, quote, women have a privacy right under the state constitution to not have that right impacted up to 24 weeks at least. More from Tramel Gomes. A Florida judge plans to put a hold on the state's new 15-week abortion ban set to take effect today. He says it's unconstitutional and will issue a temporary injunction. Groups including Planned Parenthood of America, the Center for Reproductive Rights, and the American Civil Liberties Union sued the state over the law passed by Republican lawmakers, claiming it violates the right to privacy in the state constitution. Circuit Judge John Cooper agreed, just days after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned federal protections for abortions. However, Democratic State Representative Yvonne Hinson predicts that Governor Ron DeSantis will follow through on his promise to fight to keep the ban. He not only will appeal, but come back full force uh, with the full weight of his office to try and do a full ban. 
Uh, we can expect that if we don't go to the polls with that understanding. The Florida abortion ban includes no exception for cases of rape or incest. In response to the ruling, DeSantis says he expected it and doesn't think the state constitution mandates things like, in the governor's words, dismemberment abortions. Judge Cooper plans to issue the injunction on Tuesday. Hinson says anyone concerned about a possible outright ban on abortions in Florida should make their voices heard at the polls. Because in her view, DeSantis has been able to get what he wants so far. I mean, he has followed through on everything that he has said. We have to believe him and we need to vote like we believe him because... uh Everything he does is intentional. Judge Cooper cited Section 23 of the Florida Constitution, which states, Every natural person has the right to be left alone and free from governmental intrusion into the person's private life, except as otherwise provided herein. Republicans have long struggled to restrict abortions in the state because of this privacy clause. This is Tremel Gomes for Florida News Connection. North Dakota's only abortion provider is moving across the border to Minnesota so it can continue providing abortions for North Dakota patients. The North Dakota state legislature, though, is expected to take up legislation that would make it illegal to travel to another state to obtain an abortion. Suzanne Potter reports. Pro-choice advocates are calling on voters to make access to abortion a big issue in the November midterm election. The countdown has begun. In less than a month, North Dakota's trigger law will make abortion illegal except to save the pregnant person's life now that the U.S. Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade. Amy Jacobson with Prairie Action ND says a lot of North Dakotans want access to abortion care. North Dakota voters rejected an abortion ban in 2014 by a two-to-one margin. Those are Republican voters defeating an abortion ban in our state. So I would just really call on them to reflect on where their party is going and what this means to the people of our state. The state legislature, citing religious and moral objections, tried to add an abortion ban to the state constitution, but the accompanying ballot measure failed in 2014. In mid-May, pro-choice protesters held Ban Off Our Bodies rallies in Bismarck, Fargo, Grand Forks, and Minot. More are planned for early July. The state's only abortion provider, the Red River Women's Clinic in Fargo, announced plans to move across the border to Moorhead, Minnesota in the near future. Jacobson laments what she calls an ultra-conservative takeover of the Republican Party. This decision really comes from the right-wing majority of extremist judges that have undermined the fundamental right to make our own decisions about our health care, our bodies, and our families. North Dakota already has a ban on abortion consultations via telehealth. Jacobson predicts that when the next legislative session begins in January, lawmakers will introduce bills to further restrict abortion by making it illegal to travel to another state for an abortion or to help someone else do so. For Prairie News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. What do we want? When do we want it? Hundreds of people shut down street access outside the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. yesterday to protest the high court's reversal of Roe v. Wade. Police reported arresting 187 people. Among them was Southern California Democrat Judy Chu. She's the sponsor of the Women's Health Protection Act that would enshrine abortion rights into federal law. She spoke to ACT TV. I want to make sure every woman in every state has access to an abortion as the way it was for the past 50 years. And I have my bill, the Women's Health Protection Act, which would do exactly that. It passed out of the House, but it's stuck in the Senate. We just need two votes to end the filibuster and vote the Women's Health Protection Act in. That's how close we are. A new poll finds a growing number of people identify abortion or women's rights as priorities for the government in the wake of the Supreme Court reversal of Roe v. Wade, especially Democrats and those who support access to abortion. The Associated Press Nork Center for Public Affairs research poll finds 22 percent of U.S. adults named abortion or women's rights in an open ended question as one of five problems they want the government to work on. That has nearly tripled since December. The poll included interviews conducted before and after the Supreme Court ruling. It fined prioritization of the issues grew sharply following the decision. 
This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. I'm Eileen Alfandari. A coalition of climate justice groups and progressive lawmakers is calling on Congress to expand the number of Supreme Court justices from 9 to 13 in light of its ruling weakening the EPA's authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, which are the main driver to climate change. Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey. The Supreme Court became every polluter's ally. And by undermining Uh, The fundamental authority which the EPA has to regulate greenhouse gases, uh, it has harmed um, every person in our country, but it has also undermined America's ability to be a leader internationally. Okay, it is an absolute tragedy. The only answer, ultimately, uh, is to repeal the filibuster to expand the Supreme Court to reclaim the two Uh, Supreme Court seats that were stolen by Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. Markey was joined at an event by New York Representative Jamal Bowman and the Green New Deal Network. Celebrating Pride went mainstream years ago with corporations sponsoring contingents and pride parades and making statements supporting LGBTQ rights. But activists say it's more important to follow the money. They say many of the same corporate giants that profess support for LGBTQ rights fund politicians that actively or passively oppose those rights. Eric Tegetoff reports. June is Pride Month, and businesses are showing their support for the LGBTQ community in a number of ways. But some corporations are being called out for also supporting anti-LGBTQ candidates for office. Ian Morton heads the Q Center in Portland. He says his community has come a long way from the days when participants in Pride parades couldn't show their faces for fear of retaliation from their employers. But he adds the hypocrisy of some companies' support this month is disappointing. Seeing organizations who are willing to stand against the community that they would purport to serve or to celebrate makes the LGBTQ plus community very wary of where they put their support and whether that rainbow flag that goes up for the 30 days, if that's actually meaningful or if it's just performative. A report from last month found 25 major corporations that showed support during Pride had also given a total of $10 million in donations to support members of Congress who earned a zero rating on the Human Rights Campaign scorecard. Craig Hill is with Beneficial State Bank, which works with the Q Center. He says his bank strives to work in service of social equity and environmental sustainability. Hill thinks it's misleading for companies to hoist rainbow flags and, at the same time, support discriminatory policies at the legislative level. Some of the nation's biggest banks, for example, fund anti-LGBTQ plus policies to their political donations, despite publicly supporting those agendas and sponsoring Pride Month events. It's really a form of rainbow washing, for being honest. Hill says people can use websites like Mighty Deposit to find out how their financial institutions are using their money. Morton says it's helpful to know he's working with companies that align with his own values. Having those moments whenever you recognize that the folks you're doing business with actually have concern about your community's well-being and want to show up in meaningful ways, that helps folks, especially in the nonprofit sector and in the advocacy sector, to give them the energy to soldier on. For Oregon News Service, I'm Eric Tegedoff. The Biden administration this evening released plans for up to 10 offshore leases for oil and gas drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and one off the Alaska coast over the next five years. The release on a Friday afternoon leading into a holiday weekend is a time-worn tactic of administrations when they announce unpopular moves. Administration officials said fewer than 11 leases or even no lease sales at all could occur with a final decision not due for months. New drilling off the Atlantic and Pacific Coast would be blocked after being considered under the Trump administration. The Biden plan is scaled back compared to the Trump-era proposal that called for dozens of offshore drilling leases, but environmentalists still accused Biden of betraying his climate promises.
California North Coast Congressman Jared Huffman, who sits on climate and ocean subcommittees, said in a statement that offshore drilling poses unacceptable risks. He added, we should not put our oceans and fisheries, coastal communities, economies and planet at risk just to enrich the fossil fuel industry. Referring to rising prices at the gas pump, Huffman said handing over new leases won't lower prices by a penny. The executive director of the environmental nonprofit group Healthy Gulf called the lease sale plan a huge loss for Gulf residents, U.S. energy policy and the global climate. On the other hand, Democrat Joe Manchin, who chairs the Senate Energy Committee and is a longtime friend of the fossil fuel industry, welcomed the proposal as a chance, quote, to get our leasing program back on track. A ray of hope from the Sierra Club, which had the Biden plan to delay offshore sales until next year, is an important step toward protecting communities and climate. The Sierra Club said it urges the administration to finalize a plan that commits to no new offshore drilling leases, period. At least 21 are dead in Ukraine, including two children, after Russian missiles hit residential buildings near the port city of Odessa. President Zelensky denounced the airstrike as comments were translated by Al Jazeera. In order for Ukrainian mornings not to start so tragically as it started today with missile strikes at Odessa and Odessa region, today's morning started with a lot of victims. We want mornings of Ukrainians to become as peaceful as the mornings of each European capital in the 21st century. The attack comes after Russian forces withdrew from Snake Island in the Black Sea. That withdrawal initially was seen as lessening the threat to the Odessa region. More from Simon Marks. At least 21 people have been killed in a Russian military bombardment on the Ukrainian Black Sea port of Odessa. A holiday resort and a block of flats were targeted. The Ukrainian government called it a terrorist act by the Russians. It came on the 100th day of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Robert Fox is defence editor of the London Evening Standard. We're in a very difficult place because the fighting is very intense and very hard. Uh, for these last scraps of the Luhansk district oblast of Donbass. Uh, for once, the Russians feel that they've got a good story to tell about achievements on the battlefield. And uh, I think we'll be assessing where we are in 100 days time from now. Simon Marks reporting. U.S. basketball star Brittany Groiner went on trial at a Moscow area court on charges of possessing cannabis oil. She was arrested in February at Moscow's International Airport while traveling to play for a Russian team. The Phoenix Mercury Center and two-time U.S. Olympic gold medalist could face up to 10 years in prison if convicted of large-scale transportation of drugs. Her case comes at an extraordinary low point in relations between the U.S in Russia. Greiner was arrested less than a week before Russia sent troops into Ukraine, which aggravated already high tensions between the two countries. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has appealed the British government's decision last month to order his extradition to the United States. The appeal was filed at the high court. It was the latest twist in a decade-long legal saga sparked by his website's publication of classified U.S. documents and video, including one that included footage of possible U.S. war crimes in Iraq. Giles Gibson reports. Julian Assange has been fighting against extradition to the U.S. since 2019, and now the High Court has confirmed it's received his request for an appeal. He's facing 18 charges from the U.S. Justice Department, including alleged espionage offences. The charges relate to WikiLeaks releasing a trove of diplomatic cables and classified documents about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2010. Giles Gibson, London. Assange is so- Porter's staged protests before his 51st birthday this weekend. His wife, Stella Assange, was among those who gathered outside the British Home Office to call for his release from prison. One protester shouted the British government was colluding with the U.S. in its commission of war crimes. They have committed war crimes and you are complicit with these war crimes. A British court ruled in April Assange could be sent to face trial in the U.S., sending the case to the British government for a decision. 
The British Home Secretary, Priti Patel, signed an order on June 17th ordering Assange's or authorizing Assange's extradition. The Australian government has been under mounting pressure to intervene, but last month the new prime minister rejected calls for him to publicly demand the U.S. drop its prosecution. Assange's supporters and lawyers say he was acting as a journalist and is entitled to First Amendment protections of freedom of speech. China's leader Xi Jinping marked the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong's return with a speech today that emphasized Beijing's control over the former British colony under the one country, two systems doctrine. The speech was meant to counter criticism that the political and civic freedoms promised for the next quarter century have been largely erased under Chinese rule. She praised Hong Kong for overcoming what he called violent social unrest. He was referring to the massive pro-democracy protests in 2019 that were followed by a Beijing-driven crackdown that has snuffed out dissent and shut down independent media. Since the 2019 protests, authorities have used a sweeping national security law to arrest scores of activists, media figures, and other democracy supporters. They've introduced new pro-Beijing curriculum in schools and revamped election laws to keep opposition politicians deemed not patriotic enough out of the Hong Kong legislature. Richard Kimba filed this report. China's President Xi Jinping has dismissed international criticisms of an erosion of public freedoms in Hong Kong as he's presided over the 25th anniversary of the handover of the territory from Britain to China. He says that Beijing's one country, two systems governing principle for Hong Kong has been proven to be successful and that it will remain in place for some time. He's also urged the public in Hong Kong to be more patriotic towards the motherland, as he calls it, and also to get behind the city's new leader, the former security chief, John Lee, who President Xi Jinping inaugurated during the anniversary celebrations. All of these messages are meeting with mixed reactions in Hong Kong. Those in the older generation and in the business community are generally supportive of the idea of more integration and optimistic about the idea of more prosperity and stability in the city. However, many other people in the city, particularly in the younger generation, are still very frustrated and angry about the way that politics and society in general has changed under Beijing's influence and many are choosing to leave the city and emigrate elsewhere. Richard Kimber in Hong Kong. India banned some single-use or disposable plastic products as part of a national plan to phase out the ubiquitous material in the country of nearly 1.4 billion people. For the first stage, 19 plastic items that aren't very useful but have a potential to become litter. The law makes it illegal to produce, import, stock, distribute, or sell them. Items like plastic cups and straws and ice cream sticks, some disposable plastic bags will also be phased out and replaced with thicker, presumably reusable ones. Thousands of other plastic products like bottles for water or soda or bags of chips aren't covered by the ban, but the federal government in India has set targets for manufacturers to be responsible for recycling or disposing of them after use. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno. This newscast airs each night at 6, half-hour edition on the weekends. You can listen to it archived online at kpfa.org or kpfk.org and also as a podcast. I'm Eileen Alfandari. The California Assembly has approved a hard-fought measure allowing drug users in Los Angeles County, San Francisco, and Oakland to consume specified controlled substances in sterile, supervised spaces, which will have to be set up. San Francisco Democrat Matt Haney cited the nearly 1,500 people who have died of opioid overdoses in San Francisco over the past two years, almost double the number of COVID-19 deaths in the same period. Haney said that safe consumption sites will save lives. Overdose prevention programs bring the opioid crisis and drug use off our streets and parks and out of people's doorsteps. They save lives by allowing people to use controlled substances under the supervision of staff trained to prevent and treat overdoses. These sites also stop the spread of HIV and hepatitis by having clean supplies on hand and most importantly provide testing to make sure that drugs that might be laced with deadly fentanyl that is killing people in our state are stopped. 
Opponents said that safe injection sites would encourage drug use and that areas surrounding the sites would become more dangerous. Orange County Republican Lori Davies said government should instead focus on tightening controls at the border. And right now, majority of fentanyl, which is killing one pill kills like that, is coming across our border and we're doing nothing to stop that. There's one solution right there. Why don't we stop the flow coming from the border? Those in favor of safe injection sites said that while ideally programs such as those would encourage users to enroll in rehabilitation programs, those programs are useless if users can't survive long enough to find their way into them. San Jose Democrat Ash Kalra said that fear-mongering and the previous war on drugs drove up incarceration rates and did little for the safety or health of drug users. We got to face, as mentioned by some, the public health aspect of it. The number one goal in public health is to save lives. And that's what these injection sites do. So I'll implore my colleagues to not buy into the same fear tactics and terminology and the lexicon from the 80s and 90s during the failed war on drugs and instead listen to the experts Follow the facts of what's actually happening around the world and let these jurisdictions try it. The ones that are actually seeing people dying on their streets. The measure passed the assembly on a vote of 42 to 28. That was just one more vote than needed. It had bipartisan opposition amid a sometimes personal debate. Two members, Carlos Villapudua and Freddy Rodriguez, disclosed if their brothers had each died of complications from drug abuse. They were among the Democrats who spoke against the proposal. The measure is a pilot program that will expire in six years unless it's extended. The measure now goes back to the state Senate for final approval and then to Governor Newsom for a signature. California will not consider amending its state constitution to eliminate an exemption that allows indentured servitude to punish crime. The proposal stalled largely because the Newsom administration predicted it could cost the state billions of dollars if prisoners had to be paid the minimum wage. Democratic State Senator Sidney Kalmlager said that she ran out of time to push her bill through. The measure, borrowing involuntary work without pay, fell seven votes short of the two-thirds margin it needed in the state Senate last week. California, which already has some of the nation's toughest gun laws, has added new restrictions on untraceable ghost guns and on marketing firearms to children. In a recorded video, California Governor Gavin Newsom held an AR-15 and stood before his and hers ads of skulls-sucking pacifiers as he announced his action and chided the U.S. Supreme Court and right-wing Republicans. Do you have no common decency, respect, or even common understanding that kids should not have one of these? This is an AR-15. This is a weapon of war, a weapon of mass destruction. But you're out there promoting and allowing marketing of these weapons of war to our kids, supporting and celebrating gun manufacturers to put up advertisements like the ones you see behind me. These are cartoon skulls with pacifiers in them. His and her pacifiers, cartoon skulls of children with pacifiers. This is what the right wing is marketing and promoting at the behest of the gun industry in this country. The good news, if there's any, is that this ends at least today in California. The new law bars marketing firearms to children with a civil penalty of up to $25,000 for each violation, and it allows people harmed by violations to sue for damages. California will now also require parts used to build firearms to have serial numbers. It gives Californians who have weapons without serial numbers until January 1st of 2024 to register them and add the numbers. Starting in January of next year, anyone convicted of manufacturing a firearm without a serial number or aiding the manufacture of a firearm by a prohibited person will be barred from possessing a firearm for 10 years. Sam Paredes, the executive director of Gun Owners of California, said California lacks a clear definition of what constitutes a ghost gun kit. He predicted the new law will be overturned 
based on the tougher standards set last week by the U.S. Supreme Court in its landmark ruling that said people have a right to carry firearms in public for self-defense. In response to that Supreme Court ruling, New York lawmakers approved a sweeping overhaul of that state's handgun licensing rules. The measure passed by wide margins. It's almost sure to draw more legal challenges from gun rights advocates who say New York is still putting too many restrictions on who can get guns and where they can carry them. Among other things, the state's new rules will require people applying for a handgun license to turn over a list of their social media accounts so officials can verify their character and conduct. According to the new law, applicants would have to show they have the, quote, essential character, temperament, and judgment necessary to be entrusted with a weapon and to use it only in a manner that does not endanger oneself and others. Gun rights advocates and Republican leaders were incensed, saying the legislation not only violated the Second Amendment, but also privacy and free speech rights. People applying for a license to carry a New York handgun would also have to provide four character references, take 16 hours of firearm safety training, plus two hours of practice at a range, undergo periodic background checks, and turn over contact information for their spouse, domestic partner, or any other adults living in their household. New York would bar people from bringing guns into any businesses or workplaces unless the owners put up signs saying guns are welcome. They'd also be banned in places of worship, libraries, public playgrounds, parks, daycare centers, summer camps, addiction and mental health centers, shelters, public transit, bars, theaters, stadiums, museum, polling places, and casinos. A California bill that sets ambitious goals for locking more carbon into the ground is advancing in the state Senate. Supporters say it would slow climate change and help capture pollution in overburdened communities. Suzanne Potter reports. AB 2649, which just passed the State Senate Environmental Quality Committee on Wednesday, sets a big goal to remove 60 million metric tons of carbon from the atmosphere per year by 2030, all by harnessing nature. Ellie Cohen is CEO of a nonprofit statewide advocacy group called the Climate Center. She says the plan to sequester more carbon in the ground will slow climate change and help the environment. Anything that we do to improve the soil, it helps hold more water when it does rain. It helps to replenish groundwater. It supports biodiversity. It supports food security. It helps ensure cleaner air. So you get many, many co-benefits that help us to be more resilient. I'm Suzanne Potter. Retail workers at outdoor and sports co-op REI announced a unionization effort for the Berkeley store late yesterday. It's the latest retail company to face a union drive and comes after more than 100 Starbucks stores have unionized. Violette Ballou filed this report from Berkeley. Si se puede, 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 About a hundred retail workers and union leaders gathered at REI's storefront in Berkeley to support new unionizing efforts at the retail giant. They've got the support of Berkeley elected leaders and also the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 5, UFCW5. Jules Garrett has been working at REI as a sales lead for nine years. He says the union seeks guarantee that all workers make a living wage and the elimination of sexism and racism at the Berkeley store. I discovered that workers were being subject to episodes of racism and sexual harassment that have never truly been resolved. That some of our most tenured hardworking staff were being paid less for their efforts than employees who'd been with REI for less than a year and it's for that reason that I began organizing because I believe that the next step for a company that values itself as progressive that not only recognizes the inequities and prejudices faced by non-white non-cis heteronormative non-male members of the outdoor industry but strives to remedy those injustices last week REI staff at the Berkeley 
Play Store to successfully file for a union election after delivering a letter to management informing the company that a majority of more than 100 workers have signed union authorization cards. Garrett said the next step is to formally introduce the voice of the workforce by giving workers a say in their schedules or by ensuring their voice counts in how the outdoor and sports retail co-ops policies are made. Liz Ortega is the secretary treasurer of the Alameda Central Labor Council, which represents 135,000 workers. She emphasized what she called the lack of workers' protection laws across the state and the importance of unionization efforts like those at REI. All across this country, we've seen uh, the rise in workers saying enough is enough. It's enough that we have to watch 50 years of law go backwards. That should not be happening. It should not be happening that all the work we've done to clean our environment and our world is now taken back another 50 years. Everybody knows that a union makes a difference. And one job should be enough. The Berkeley store is not the first REI store to attempt to unionize. Workers at the Manhattan store became the first to successfully union earlier this year. It is a part of a wave of union activity and comes as workers at hundreds of Starbucks storefronts have unionized. Like Starbucks workers, REI workers say they're faced pushback by the company. According to UFCW5 director of strategic campaigns Jim Araby, Berkeley's REI store manager has has taken individuals on walks to discuss why it is good to be union free. REI's CEO reportedly has said it would like to remain union free and yesterday the company said it raised benefits for its non-union workers. REI did not respond to KPFA's request for comment by airtime. Catherine Lee Barger represents workers at University of California and is also the president of the California Labor Federation. She urged REI's workers to not back down from what she called the company's union busting tactics. Let's be clear, you have power. If REI is resisting you, if they are scared of you, it is only because you are organizing your power. And you are using it to demand the respect that everybody in this country deserves, that we often, too often get lip service for, but that you are fighting for and that you will win. And power like that is immediate, it is intimate, it is deeply felt in your own life, in your family's life, and it is epic. Earlier this week, the Berkeley City Council passed a resolution to support the union drive for REI's retail workers. An online petition to support Berkeley REI's union campaign is available on Twitter. I'm Violette Bellou, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. Amazon is barring off-duty warehouse workers from the company's facilities. Under the policy, employees are barred from accessing buildings or other working areas on their scheduled days off and before or after their shifts. Amazon says the policy doesn't prohibit off-duty employees from engaging co-workers in non-working areas outside the company's buildings. It also says the policy won't be enforced in a discriminatory fashion against employees seeking to unionize, but organizers say the new rule will hinder union organizing drives. California lawmakers and anti-hate organization leaders spoke outside the Chinese Historical Society of American Museum today to bring attention to AAPI hate crimes in light of a newly released hate crime in California report. Avery Luke filed this report from San Francisco. Assembly members today stood outside the Stop AAPI Hate Mural in San Francisco's Chinatown alongside members of the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities to discuss legislative actions being taken to address the crisis of hate crimes against Asian Americans. State Attorney General Rob Bonta's hate crime in California report released earlier this week showed a 33% spike in hate crimes since last year, with the highest number of hate crimes in the Bay Area occurring in San Francisco. California State Assembly member Matt Haney called the report a reason for the community to come together in solidarity against hate. Hate crimes and hate incidents in California in 2021 were worse than any other year that we've collected this data uh, since 1995. Uh, so we know that our seniors, uh, 
in many cases are afraid to go to, to the store, afraid to get on the bus because of fear. Uh, and that's what is reflected in this report. And awareness is important. And, and making sure people understand that this is happening is important. But what's more important is that we take action. Stop AAPI Hate is a coalition that tracks, documents, and responds to incidents of hate, violence, and discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States. It was founded in 2020, co-founded by Chinese for Affirmative Action in response to the rise in racist attacks against the AAPI community as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Vincent Pan, who is the co-director for Chinese Affirmative Action, said that in order to push back against hate, all communities have to work together. This is a problem that faces our African-American community, our Latinx community, our LGBTQ plus community, uh, you know, that there's religious uh, hate and bigotry as well, uh, and that Asian Americans have to join this broader coalition, and this broader coalition must engage with the Asian American community to develop the effective solutions that we need. Last year, Governor Newsom passed the API Equity Budget, which provides $156 million in grants to California's API community. The budget will be used to fund critical resources in response to the surge in anti-API hate, as well as address the long-standing racial inequities that have harmed the API community for generations. Another measure by San Francisco Assembly member Phil Ting requires all law enforcement to have a hate crime policy to standardize response and data collection. Ting said a major problem is that not every county in California is reporting hate crimes that occur. The numbers are grim and are shocking, but unfortunately not every county is reporting hate crimes. So if you look at Riverside and San Bernardino, they're not reporting any hate crimes. It's not because there aren't any hate incidents or crimes happening in those communities. It's because for whatever reason, law enforcement doesn't have a policy. They haven't identified the hate crimes. They don't know exactly how to do that. So we're asking Post, which is in charge of uh, overseeing law enforcement all around the state, to develop a hate crimes best practice and a hate crimes policy, and then asking every single law enforcement agency in the state to adopt that, adopt a policy and report back to Post. Another bill introduced by Ting will protect customers at large businesses by training employees on how to take action when they spot discrimination and harassment. A second round of Stop AAPI hate grants is expected to be announced this summer. For KPFA News, I'm Avery Luke. This is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandari. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story, or an idea, or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. The use of police dogs is often, uh, police dogs are often deployed on people suspected of minor crimes. They can seriously injure or hurt people and leave lasting physical and emotional trauma. California state laws don't clearly say when it's okay to use them, and they're not always under a police officer's control. Up next, an investigative report from Catherine Monahan. Live here in the USA like 20 years. 20 years. Ali Bader is a rideshare driver in the Bay Area. Like many people, he fell on hard times during the pandemic. I lost my car because I, I can't afford the, to pay the insurance, all, this, all that. So I rented a car. I rented With the car he rented, he started delivering for DoorDash and Instacart, and he got a job at a Chevron gas station. But then, he says, he lost his debit card and had to wait for a new one to arrive in the mail. So he called the rental car company, Car Mommy, to explain that his payment would be late. 
He says, they said that was fine. Uh, they tell me, okay, they can wait for me. I am a good guy. They know me. There's no problems. It's okay. But in fact, the company reported the car as stolen. And on the night of December 20th, 2020, when Bader drove to his shift at Chevron, an automatic license plate reader alerted the San Ramon Police Department. Bader says half a dozen police cars surrounded him. Body cam footage shows lights flashing, officers drawing guns, a police dog straining at its leash, lunging toward Bader, who is moving slowly, barefoot, following instruction. They tell me, put your hand out of the car. I did. Go out of the car. I did. And I open the door. And as soon as I go outside. The dog leaps at Bader, latches its jaws onto his arm, and starts shaking its head all around. On the ground! I don't do nothing! Uh, what I did! What I did! Get on the ground! Bader is lying face down in the street, yelling in pain, asking what he did, while the dog bites him for almost a full minute. A year and a half later, Bader says he still can't move his arm fully. He pulls up his sleeve and shows it to me. The scars from his 36 stitches make his arm look like the top of a football. He's had three surgeries so far. And the doctor told me maybe we need another surgery too, because it was big hurt. Bader is suing the city of San Ramon, the police chief and involved officers, car mommy and others for his injuries, both physical and emotional. So I didn't do anything wrong in my life. So for me, this is something that was shocking inside me. I don't understand what's going on. The San Ramon city attorney sent a statement blaming the events on the rental car company, saying, quote, It is clear that the misleading report of the stolen vehicle set the unfortunate chain of events in motion, unquote. Neither the San Ramon Police Department nor Car Mommy responded to requests for comment. Nationwide, police dog bites sent almost 33,000 people to emergency rooms between 2005 and 2013, according to a study in the Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine. Almost all of them were men, and over 40% of them were black. Challen Stevens, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with The Marshall Project, spent over a year reporting on 150 of the worst police dog bite cases in the country. In San Diego, a woman lost her scalp. People lose limbs. We had somebody die in Montgomery, Alabama, bitten to death. Sometimes the dogs bit the wrong person, like their officers or bystanders. Including a uh, pregnant woman in Indianapolis who was bitten on her front porch. Stephen says it was very hard to get information from the police, so he searched through hospital and court records from across the country. In most of the cases he looked at, the victims were unarmed. Many were undergoing a mental health crisis. We saw that again and again. Somebody's standing in the street, and they're not making a lot of sense, and the police send the dog. He says the people often became traumatized, scared of dogs, scared of police, reclusive. So while... Police might be stopping somebody for shoplifting or disorderly conduct. The use of a dog can elevate what is a, a passing moment, a small crime, into a permanent life injury. I wanted to understand how this is supposed to work, how police dogs are supposed to function. So I visited Rob Pelado, who used to be a canine officer with the Dos Palos Police Department. I think there's a misunderstanding of how this work is done. We're at Peldo's business, the next-gen canine training facility in Vallejo, where he trains police dogs for several California departments, though not for either of the police departments cited in this story. It's in a big, echoey building. The number one job of any police canine is a locating tool. Peldo says a dog's main purpose is to find missing persons, or narcotics, or explosives. But if somebody is resisting arrest... A dog is a pain compliance tool. Because we're not getting compliance through verbal communication. Pain compliance means using pain to force a person into submission. Peldo has arranged a training demonstration. One of his trainers puts on a bite sleeve, which looks like a stiff doormat in the shape of a cast. Another brings in a German shepherd on a leash. This is one of my personal dogs, and he belonged to a friend of mine who was killed in the line of duty in November. So He's more of a screamer. Is it fit to approach or not? Oh, yeah. The dog jumps up and uh, bites onto the sleeve, and the trainer waves their arm around as the dog just <laughs> grinds into it. So he's biting down into it, just 
trying to take it for himself. Paletto has heard about Ali Bader's case. He says that using a dog was actually the more humane option. At that distance, a taser wouldn't work. At that distance, pepper spray wouldn't work. At that distance, a stick wouldn't work. If the dog wasn't there, the only thing that would reach that point would be a bullet. The body cam doesn't show Bader physically threatening the police. Dogs can be unpredictable, and law enforcement officers cannot always control them. Which brings us to our second story, where the dog just wouldn't let go. I got half a calf now, if you can see it. That's Jamar Lindsay, who is a black grandfather. He's sitting in a public park on a sunny day. The upper half of my calf is, like, dented in. Like, I can't put too much pressure on my leg, and then I have all these scars in the front of my leg to where, like, it's still mushy. Lindsay says he was waiting at a bus stop at night in the city of San Pablo in February 2021. And I was sitting in the front of Jack in the Box on San Pablo Road, and I think I want to say two officers pulled up and asked me if I was Jamar Lindsay. Police body cam footage shows him getting out his phone and... Calling my son to tell him to tell his mom that I'm probably going to go to jail. In the footage, he does not reach for a weapon or make any threats. He's just standing quietly with his phone, ignoring the officer's questions. Don't make this harder than it has to be, dude. Drop the phone, put your hands on your head. The officer goes to his car and gets his dog. And by the time he returns, Lindsay is face down on the pavement under two more police officers, one of whom has a knee in Lindsay's back. And then the canine officer releases the dog. All you had to do was comply. The dog tears into Lindsay's leg and shakes its head. After about 20 seconds, the officer commands it to let go, but it doesn't. And this goes on for three more minutes. The officer tries pulling on the dog's collar with both hands, pulling on its hips. Another officer comes over and stands on Lindsay's ankle to try to pry it in the opposite direction. And the dog just continue to eat at my leg. Finally, they have to cut Lindsay's jeans because even after they pull the dog off his flesh, it won't release its bite. And I'm not I'm not going to say I'm no angel, you know what I mean? But like, I don't think I've ever been treated like that. Like, to lay on the ground in a defenseless position and for your guys to allow the dog to mutilate my leg. Now Lindsay is suing the city of San Pablo and the officers involved. California doesn't have any laws that explicitly address when it's okay to deploy police dogs against people. It allows individual departments to make their own canine policies. San Pablo Police Captain Brian Bubar said he couldn't comment on the case since litigation is ongoing. But he agreed to talk about his department's policies around canines and use of force. So the dog is only brought out under a very specific uh, criteria, either to do a search or when confronted with imminent uh, threat of violence. Police department policies in both San Pablo and San Ramon state that dogs should only be used if a person is threatening violence, is physically resisting arrest, or is concealed somewhere that's unsafe for an officer to enter, and the officer should give a warning before releasing the dog. The policies also say that once the person no longer poses a threat, the police should command the dog to release the bite. The body cam footage from Ali Badr's and Jamar Lindsay's arrests shows that neither man was hiding or running away or threatening violence. Neither was warned before a police dog was released. And in both cases, the dog continued to bite after the person was physically restrained. John Burris's law firm is representing Jamar Lindsay. Burris says the California Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, POST, should establish canine standards to tell officers... When you should call the dog off. You know, say, now we know it by professionalism, what, what's, you know, too much, we you know, but I don't know, some officers may claim they don't know what's too much, although I think that's wrong. I think common sense will tell you what's too much, too much, but the guidelines never hurt. And so guidelines from post and over any department should be established. The commission sets voluntary minimum standards for California law enforcement. Post declined an interview but confirmed that its canine guidelines, which are almost a decade old, are optional. The guidelines recommend that officers train their dogs to bite and release on verbal command, but they say nothing about when it's appropriate to bite or when to release. Burris says the police department should update their canine policies. There shouldn't be a, a policy of 
finding and biting. You should be finding and barking that alerts the trainer or the dog handler that the person is caught and apprehended. But I don't think biting is necessary. Mm. It should be avoided at all costs because of the, the physical harm that it creates and the emotional harm that it creates. And that report by Catherine Monahan. Many thanks to her. This is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandari. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thanks to EA, who produced recorded portions and has been at the controls. Carlos Santana. You know, every time I take a solo on my guitar, I'm telling a story. So I learned from my father and and B.B. King and Miles. The reason I mention all of them is because I am them. I, I, I identify with their spirit. All of them taught me to tell a story. I am a master storyteller, you know, and, and, uh, and I utilize melody or friends like you, uh, your heart and your pen and journalists to pass the word through the stories. Miracles and blessings are very close to you. Will you come forward and receive them? KPFA, storytelling for social change. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.